and welcome to this special service of worship as we join together to celebrate on this Senior Sunday. This is a time where we celebrate specifically the senior graduates from high school within our church community, but it's also a time for us to remember all of those graduates in our midst, whether it be from kindergarten all the way up through college and beyond. It's a wonderful time as we celebrate their accomplishments and as we join together in this time of worship as well. So at this time, I invite you to join me as we share together in prayer. God of knowledge, wisdom, and truth, we thank you for the seniors and all the graduates that we are celebrating today. We thank you for the people who have taught, supported, and encouraged them throughout their lives. And we ask that you might continue to work in their lives and in our lives as well as we seek to grow in your discipleship and love. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen.
come to our time of sharing joys and concerns with one another, I wanted to gather here in this space. This is our youth room that uh, our youth director, Mark Reedy, has spent a lot of time and energy and effort to prepare as a very sacred and holy place for the youth to gather for uh, their Sunday morning, uh, Sunday school classes, other times of fellowship. You can see he has uh, made this, this beautiful uh, altar space uh, as a time and a place for us to be in the spirit and in the presence of God as we honor our graduating folks at various levels uh, today. So I want to thank Mark for preparing and bringing a message uh, that speaks not only to those who are graduating at various levels of their education, not just high school, but we're also mindful of our preschool graduates here at the uh, KCA, the Keith Children's Academy, um, also our fifth grade graduates, our eighth grade graduates, as well as college graduates and beyond, uh, law school, graduate school, other folks uh, that we honor and celebrate today. So thank Mark for his uh, message that he's prepared for, not only for them, but for all of us together this day. Um, also wanted to uh, lift up a, a word of gratitude to all in our congregation who purchased gift cards through the United Methodist Women, and in particular, cards to go to our healthcare heroes here in our community. Uh, there were a total of 107 cards uh, that have been uh, sent out into our hospital and into our community uh, that represents $2,695 collected from you all to uh, show our love and support and gratitude to our healthcare workers during this time. So thanks to all of you who uh, helped make that possible. Thanks to Pat Grayson for organizing and, and uh, co coordinating that effort, and also to Alex Barlock for uh, promoting that within our church communications. Um, also wanted to say a word of gratitude to all the folks who uh, take part in our Nourish One Child ministry, which uh, follows the school year, and so this past week was the last year, or last week until the summer, uh, of providing that weekend uh, bags of nourishment to our city school children. Uh, but so many hands go into this work, from preparing the bags, to receiving the shipments of food, to stocking the shelves, to uh, putting the food in the bags, to delivering the bags to the various schools. Uh, so many of you take part in that. And uh, just I wanted to say a word. Uh, as the school system now enters into its summer time of vacation. Uh, just a word of thanks to all of you for helping with that. Also a joy uh, this coming week, uh, next Saturday, Andrew and Allie will be uniting in marriage in our church sanctuary with appropriate uh, social distancing and uh, very much limited on the number of folks who will be able to be in attendance for that. Uh, but we do rejoice with them as they're anticipating that day and as they're preparing for their wedding shower virtually on Thursday afternoon at 4. And uh, so we look forward to celebrating that with them as well. A number of concerns that we have on our hearts. We want to continue to lift up all of the folks who are uh, at our life care center here, all of our patients all the staff members who are there, as well as at our hospital and other care facilities here in this area. Want to continue to lift them up in our prayers. Want to lift up the uh, City of Athens uh, as they are reviewing uh, the budget and making some adjustments to that. Uh, we know that there are some difficult decisions that need to be made that affect not only uh, the services that we enjoy here in the city, but also affect um, some of our city employees uh, and their families' lives. And so we pray for wisdom in those, uh, in our leaders, in the decisions that are before them. Also want to continue to lift up all of the folks who are experiencing uh, the economic impact of this pandemic, those who have lost their jobs, are trying to file for unemployment, um, and who may be looking for other jobs. Want to continue to lift up those folks in our prayers um, and all of our local businesses, and even some of our local churches that are in the process of reopening, uh, we pray for continued safety and health 
and good practices for everyone. If you do have some uh, joys or concerns that you would like to share with us, you can let us know by email at information at keithumc.org, and we will be glad to lift up and join with you in the prayers that are on your hearts. Let us go now to the Lord in this time of prayer. O oh God of all of the ages and stages of our lives, just as you were with Abraham long ago as he made his journey by stages from his homeland to the land which you promised him, and just as you led your people Israel by stages through the wilderness on their long and winding journey from slavery in Egypt to freedom and flourishing in the land that you promised to them. And just as Jesus himself increased in wisdom and in years throughout the stages of his life, so too do we give you thanks this day that you are always with each one of us throughout the stages of our lives. We give you our thanks this day for those who are graduating this year from one stage of life to the next. We thank you for all of those who have accompanied them along their journey and who have encouraged them on their way for parents and teachers, for pastors and coaches and mentors, friends, as well as those who will welcome them in whatever the next steps of their journey may be. I pray that they may always sense your presence and your guidance in their lives. And I also thank you that you are always with us as we continue as a people to make our way through the wilderness of this pandemic. We thank you for those who have recovered from this and from other illnesses. We pray for those who are sick and for those who care for them and tend to them. We pray for those who are working on treatments and a vaccine for the work that they are doing to prosper. And we pray for all of those who are bearing the biggest burdens of the economic impact of this time. For those who have to make difficult decisions for their lives, for their families, and for their community. And Lord, I pray for our churches and for our businesses that are reopening in the area. We pray for the health and for the safety of all of those. And Lord, I pray for all of us at whatever stage of life that we may find ourselves in this day, whatever level of risk tolerance that we may feel in this time. Lord, one of the things that this virus has made abundantly clear to us all is that we are in this together and that our lives can impact the lives of others for good and for ill. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would help us always to seek the good, not just of ourselves, but of others, so that our lives, all that we say and do in this world in which we share together, might be a blessing to others and bring glory to you. Lord, I lift up my prayer along with the prayers of others who are gathered together in worship this day. As we pray together the prayer that Jesus gave us when we pray together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now in continued gratitude and thanksgiving for all of the ways that you continue to support the ministries and the mission of our church here in this community and around the world, I invite us now to give our offerings to the glory of God and you may do that in one of three ways. You can go to our website, www.keithumc.org, and tap on the Donate button that's in the upper right-hand corner. 
Uh, you can also give through our app, through the give button that's there. And you can also uh, send in a check to our mailing address at Post Office Box 1 here in Athens, Tennessee, 37371. Let us now continue to bring glory and honor to God through the giving of ourselves, through the, our gifts and our all.
dude, I'm psyched about getting to do the sermon. Best thing about coronavirus quarantine, you don't have to dress up. This is going to be videotaped? Yeah, I've seen your sermons, dude. It's not like I'm busy or anything. <clears throat> well, no, I'm not trying to give SPR a good excuse to save money. I'll go change. What do you mean this isn't the kind of shirt that you put a tie on? I didn't learn this kind of stuff in youth ministry school. Okay, great. Now it's raining. Hope you're happy, Andrew. Hope you're happy. All right, today's sermon is titled, Seeing God, an Act of Unfocusing. The scripture comes from John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The word of the Lord. Don't you want God to be with you forever? That's what this scripture is talking about. And yet, even though God is here, right now, with us, the scripture indicates that some cannot see God. The Christ speaks and says, in a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. And to see the divine is to be truly alive. Christ speaks and says, because I live, you also will live. Some see, others don't see. Most of us have the arrogance to assume that we already see just fine. Maybe we need to get our eyes checked. But this all leads us to the most important question Today, how, how do I see God? Perhaps the greatest obstacle in the year 2020 to seeing God is that our minds are not prepared for it. I remember a saddening conversation I had with a 17-year-old boy several years ago. I had given a sermon to a crowd of boys um, that had gathered to play basketball in the church. Many of them were not from our church. And after the sermon and after the final game, the crowds dispersed and one young man was lingering behind. Uh, it was pretty obvious that he wanted to talk. So I walked up to him and it got real. He admitted to me that he didn't believe in God. Why? Because he had asked to see God, to hear God's voice, and he got nothing but silence. He was completely devastated by God's seeming absence. His life was falling apart. He was miserable, he was alone, and what would his parents think of him? when they found out that he could not believe in God anymore. Now, I was particularly touched by this encounter 
because I too quit believing in God around the age of 20. In fact, it's why I wanted to talk about how to see God for Senior Sunday. I anticipate that some of our graduates might be desperate to see God in the years to come. Especially Philip, that guy. I'm just kidding. Uh, There is no Philip in our graduating class, so just making sure you're listening. The story of the 17-year-old boy, my story as a 20-year-old, These are more common than you might think, especially in my generation and the generation beneath me. Maybe you already are starting to have doubts because you just can't see God anywhere. If not, maybe this will resonate with you at some point in your future. Maybe someone you care about deeply already feels this way. In any case, I can't think of any question more important this morning than how do I see God. First, we've got to talk about how not to go about seeing God. You don't see God by focusing your attention. What I mean is that seeing God is not an act of extreme concentration. Seeing God always comes as a surprise. So how could God surprise you while you are busy focusing here, focusing there, planning to focus more tomorrow? By the way, there's tons of self-help books out there uh, that are on how to focus better, how to focus longer. Not very many people attempt to teach you the importance of unfocusing. Thankfully, I consider myself an expert on unfocusing. Just ask my mom or my wife. I'm rarely able to focus on anything for an extended period of time, especially if it's important. Um, I mean, it... It took me more than 40 hours to write this sermon. But that's only because it took me several hours to figure out how the Rubik's Cube works. And then a few more hours to master shooting basketball, uh, my little basketball at my goal at my desk. Rain dance! Mm, Yes! A couple hours um, praying here and there. Oh, and I lost time trying to avoid catching the Rona. (sighs) Yeah, and then, you know, a couple of hours to write stuff down and hope it doesn't flop. By the way, my mom bought me a t-shirt when I was in high school that said, easily distracted right across the the chest. And this got me the constant compliment of how well the shirt fit me. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, that's what they meant. Anyway, that's not the focus of this talk. You don't find God by straining your eyes your ears, your attention. In fact, the harder you try, the more disappointed you're gonna become. But you say, that sounds like terrible news. If I can't put forth this effort into seeing God, then how will it ever happen? Well, I think it's actually good news because humans are very bad at focusing, especially on focusing on the important things. Look, because we're so bad at this, 
It makes us susceptible to being fooled, to being tricked. Now, a malicious trick is what we call a con. You've heard of con artists. Maybe you've seen the movie Focus. Um, it's an exciting movie uh, with Will Smith. Um, I recommend it. It's pretty good. They steal watches off of people's arms without them knowing. They trick people into gambling away millions of dollars. And they do it all by getting their mark, that is their victim, to focus intently on something that isn't important. And the mark never even realizes that they've been had till it's too late. Now, when the tricks are not malicious, but instead for our entertainment, we call them magic tricks. Ooh, ah, magic. Again, the point of a magic trick is to get the audience to focus on the unimportant details so that you can trick them into thinking that magic is real. Would you like to see a magic trick? Well, since I don't have an elephant or a handsaw in the room, uh, I guess a trick with a quarter will have to suffice. Um, I'll show you that the quarter is real. All right. And, uh, oh, I think I'm supposed to do something like this. Yep, that's real enough to buy you three M&Ms, kids. Okay, so what I'm going to do is a little vanishing act, um, kind of like uh, think of Thanos. You know, Thanos does his snap, and half the people disappear. Well, when I snap, I'm going to make the quarter disappear, okay? But uh, I'm going to do the Iron Man snap later in the trick and bring the quarter back. Does it sound pretty cool? Okay, so all I have to do is when I snap, I'm going to make the quarter vanish, but it's gonna hang, I don't know, like up here, kind of out of the out of the way. All right. But um, just let me just show you the trick. All right. Ah, but it's actually right here. So, Iron Man snap. And there we have the quarter. So, um, maybe you caught what I did there. But uh, after I learned this trick, you know, um, I got all excited about magic and I wanted to learn a lot of magic tricks. And then my wife told me, ah, oh, babe, um, you see, people think that the magic trick is cool. They don't think the magician is cool. Pretty devastating. I'm waiting on her to say the same thing about youth ministry. Again, the foundation of magic tricks is to get the audience to focus on the unimportant. And the point that I want you to take away from this is that our tendency to focus on the unimportant makes us easily fooled. Another reason that we don't see God by focusing is that humans, we humans, have blind spots. This is why the scripture says that the world cannot see God. It's because God is in the blind spot of the world. Now, to illustrate uh, what I'm talking about with blind spots, um, Binoculars. I used to go in middle school, when I was in middle school, I used to be in middle school, kids, uh, you know. <laughs> but anyways, I used to go um, to UT football games with my dad. When I was in middle school, my brother was in college at UT, and he would always sit in the student section, which was the exact opposite of the field from where my dad and I would sit, okay? And so I would get to the game and I would pull up the binoculars and I would scan the crowds looking for my brother and I just couldn't find him. 
It was hopeless. And of course, eventually I would pull the binoculars down. I would squint, looking with the naked eye. Ah, I bet he's close to that section. And then I would raise the binoculars back up to get a better look. But without the ability to pull the binoculars down and see the bigger picture, it was nearly impossible to see my brother. And it seems to me that it is the same with God. Blind spots are created not just by us being tricked or fooled into focusing on the wrong thing. Blind spots are created by our own minds. They're created by our own minds. When we prefer to focus on the familiar, to focus on the comfortable, the normal, the expected. Remember, God loves to surprise us. Surprises cannot be expected, and they're rarely familiar, comfortable. <clears throat> now, there's nothing wrong with being comfortable, with being surrounded by the familiar, until it becomes the driving force of your life, until it becomes the exclusive focus of your life. I'm reminded of a film from 2008 with uh, Clint Eastwood in it called Gran Torino. In it, we see that Eastwood's character, uh, Walt, he's an old man who's stuck in his familiar comfortable ways. Uh, when one day he interrupts his young neighbor from stealing his car, which is a Gran Torino. The movie plays out and Walt and his neighbor, Tao, grow very close together. He almost becomes like a father to this boy. And we see both Walt and Tao begin to go into this uncharted territory. I mean, they're so different from one another. And Walt begins to see Tao differently. He begins to see himself differently, his world differently. I'm not going to spoil the movie for you, but I do encourage you to watch it as it perfectly illustrates our human need to go beyond the familiar. Now that we've talked about how not to see God, which in case you dozed off during my magic trick, it's not by focusing harder or better or on the familiar, let's talk about what can be done to see God. To see God is to find peace. To see God is to discover happiness, to find hope for the future. Who doesn't want those things? Careful though, seeing God doesn't remove bad things from your life, like pain and suffering, it's still there. Instead, seeing God changes how you move through the bad things. Without further ado, here it is. In my humble opinion, this is how you see God. See it all. Not just some of it. Unfocus to see it all. Chances are what you were focused on was unimportant. It may sound like cheap advice, but it's really not. Just having eyes and ears is not enough. Ezekiel points this out to us. Mortal. You are living in the midst of a rebellious house who have eyes to see, but do not see, and ears to hear, but do not hear. That's Old Testament. We must learn how to see and hear properly. So how do we see properly? How do we see it all? Prayer. Don't check out on me. I know that sounds boring, but it's not. <clears throat> because you probably think 
that prayer is a one-way street. I talk, God listens. Can get old. But you see, here's the thing. Prayer is also when you listen and you find that God has something to say. Here's an exercise in listening during prayer that just might blow your mind. Next time you're outside, alone preferably, although you could be in a group as long as everyone in the group is participating. Go sit under a tree, I don't know, lie down in a hammock, just get comfortable, okay? Close your eyes, ask God to help you hear everything around you. Here's the gift you'll find. Now, I'm only telling you now because it's important to my point. So don't rob yourself of having a firsthand experience of this. This is what you'll find. At first, you'll hear many sounds. And your brain will dismiss them under two categories, noisy, quiet. This is your mind trying to stay focused. Let go of trying to focus. Let go of the categories, noise, quiet, as you expand your awareness of the many noisy sounds, you'll divide them into categories again. Birds singing, an airplane flying overhead, a lawnmower rumbling in the distance, the sound of a, you swallowing, the wind as it brushes across your ear, even your, the very sound of your heart beating. Good, you're on your way, but you're not there yet. Lean into each sound again, one at a time. For instance, remember those birds singing? Now you realize that there are at least three different types of birds singing and Actually, there's within each type of bird, multiple songs being sung. There's a sort of uniqueness to the sound. No two robins sound exactly the same. As you finish investigating the birds, you do the same with the wind, with the planes, with your heart beating. Your world is now filled with wonderful sounds. Each one representing a life, a life that God breathed into existence. And perhaps most of them are new to you. And in between each sound is an empty space, a calm, quiet potential for the next sound to arise. And now as you have investigated each sound and the quiet spaces in between them, unfocus your ears until it all comes back together. Now you have what I call the unfocused mind. And the result is like going from black and white into full color. There's so much goodness here for you, for them, all of us, we are rich beyond our wildest imagination. And in case listening to sounds with your eyes closed in your backyard sounds like it's not a very sane thing to do, um, perhaps you would prefer a different prayer practice, one that's visual, but can be done at night so that you know your neighbors don't notice what you're doing in the backyard. So here's a second practice, this one's a visual. Go out in your backyard, lie down, look up at the stars on a clear night. As your eyes are tempted to fixate on the familiar constellations, you know, Cassiopeia, the Big Dipper, um, 
Oh yeah, Orion's belt. Well, resist the temptation to gaze upon them and hone in on them. Instead, let your gaze unfocus. Take in the whole sky. Follow your curiosity, but don't spend too long on each star. Ask yourself, is that a planet? Is that one twinkling? Have I ever looked at this one before? I wonder who else is looking at this star right now. I wonder if Jesus ever looked at this star all those years ago when he was with the disciples. Now ask yourself, is this one star any more special than the rest? If you had to pick one star that makes the whole night sky fantastic, which one would you pick? Can't do it, can you? If you had to pick one sound in your backyard <laughs> that made your backyard come alive the most, can't do it, can you? Now you have the mind that is prepared to see God. You're noticing things you didn't see before. Now you have ears to hear, eyes to see. Your mind is able to see new things, new things, new people. And we mistakenly thought only children could see new things, but it isn't so. Don't you and I need to see the world with new eyes? Don't you and I need to see ourselves with new eyes? This experience of prayer may be new to some of you. New is okay. In fact, new is great. News, ironically, eh, not so great. But what you will find as you pray to God like this is that before you sat down to see the world in a new and refreshed way, you were focused on how big your problems were. Your stress, your worries, your pain, your doubts. Before prayer, you can see how big your problems are. But after prayer, your problems are all out of focus. Because you see it all, hear it all, and God sure is bigger and louder than you would have thought. This is good news. The gate to the kingdom of heaven is not broad enough for a narrow understanding of God. It isn't magic. It isn't a con. It's just seeing God, the God in whom we live, we move, and we have our very being. My hope is that for any who desperately need to see God, that they might find themselves surprised as they begin to watch and listen. I'll close with a prayer. May you have eyes that see and ears that hear. And may you recognize the Christ living within you as you also live within God. Amen.
hope that you have enjoyed this special service of worship. And if you have enjoyed it, we hope that you might consider sharing this video with other folks that you think might enjoy it as well. And as we conclude in this time of worship, I want to lift up a special benediction, uh, one that I used to say when I was in youth group. We would end all of our youth meetings with this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. love